Hi, everybody. My name is Vivian Schiller. I'm the executive director of Aspen Digital, a program of the Aspen Institute. We are a nation at home, and our connection to the world is the internet. Adults are working from home. Kids are attending school at home. Families and friends are staying in touch and supporting each other from home. People are seeking medical care from home. In fact, I'm coming to you right now from my home. I have a laptop, I have a phone, I have powerful broadband and a wireless phone services backup. I feel very fortunate, I am very fortunate. And if you are watching this now, count yourself among the fortunate as well. And yet tens of millions of people have none of that. According to Pew, almost 50% of very low income Americans have no broadband, roughly the same percent have no access to laptops or desktop computers in their home. What has been a systemic problem till now during lockdown has become a crisis. Just this morning, the head of Prince George's County Public Schools in Maryland wrote very movingly in the Washington Post about what she's up against in her low income area. She and her school system are hacking together a patchwork of solutions. They're using their limited resources towards internet access and distributed devices. They're getting assistance and donations from Comcast and Verizon. They're getting donated laptops from manufacturers. They're getting local businesses to open their wireless hotspots so kids can connect. And yet, she writes, this unprecedented commitment is not enough to bridge the digital divide. We need, she says, a federal intervention. And that's what we're here to talk about today. We are very, very lucky to be joined by just the people who can talk about this crisis. Before I introduce them, just a few uh, bits of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, just so you know what to expect, um, our format is we're going to have a presentation. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Then I'm gonna have a conversation with our panelists uh, for a little bit. And then after that, we will be taking your questions. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little button that says Q&A. At any time, starting now or at any time, you may click on that button and you can put your question in. We ask if you, that you add your name and your affiliation if you're comfortable doing so, because that really gives us some terrific context to know where you're coming from. Again, just keep those questions going and we will uh, come get to as many of them as we can. I also want to apologize in advance for uh, the fact that we are dependent, even though I have strong broadband, this is still um, a, a system that is very overstressed, uh, particularly at Zoom. Um, so if there is any uh, jankiness, uh, to use a technical term, some delayed responses, audio, something drops out, I drop out, please bear with us, uh, just hang on, we're doing the best that we can. Also know that um, later on today, after the panel, we will be posting a uh, video. We will be posting this entire session for viewing um, offline, and uh, we will post the link to that on our Aspen Digital Twitter account, which is just at Aspen Digital. Now, let me tell you about our wonderful panelists. We have with us uh, FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks, who has been focusing on these issues for a long time. Uh, before he was appointed commissioner, uh, he, uh, Starks helped lead the FCC's Enforcement Bureau. He's been uh, in key roles at Department of Justice and a leader in national security policy. Uh, we also have Jim Steyer, best-selling author and founder and CEO of Common Sense, which is a leading organization focusing on helping kids and families be smart consumers of media and technology. They're doing a lot during this crisis. Uh, Gigi Sohn is with Georgetown Law Institute of Technology, Law and Policy. She was previously counselor to FCC Commissioner Tom Wheeler during the last administration and has long focused on communication policy and advocacy. And last but not least, we have Larry Irving, whose groundbreaking study uh, first popularized the term digital divide and revealed the depths or the breadth, I should say, of that digital divide. When he was part of the Clinton administration, he helped establish some of the earliest and most foundational US domestic and international internet policies. Uh, Larry is going to lead us up, uh, lead us off with some context around the depth of the challenge today and what needs to happen. So uh, let's bring Larry uh, back on. Larry uh, will be joining us in just a second. Thank you, Vivian. Hey, Larry. It's Good to, to see you. Here. I'm happy uh, to be here. 
Yeah, from my home to yours. Thank uh, you. Great. Well, thanks for joining us. And I'm now going to go off screen and turn it over to you to, um, and, and then I'll come back afterwards to chat about what you're presenting. Great. Um, it's an honor to be here, particularly with my good friend, uh, Jeffrey Starks and Jim and Gigi and Vivian. Um, the question I get asked most often is where does the term digital divide come from? Where did it or, um, originate? And I can't tell you um, that because nobody, nobody remembers. What I can tell you is it started because of a trip I took with then Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown. We went to Cupertino and we saw these great kids and they were sitting around these uh, iMacs and they had these wonderful iMacs of uh, eight kids to a computer. And then we went 10 minutes up the road, 15 minutes up the road to Hunters Point and to a school called Thurgood Marshall High School. Those kids were predominantly black and brown. They would, dis and can we go to that sl uh, next slide? They would uh, disproportionately low income. They would disproportionately own the school lunch program. What we realized then that we had a problem. Within a half hour drive, we had kids in, in America who had all the technology that ever, ever could use. And we had other kids in America who um, had no idea that the internet existed. So what we did was, next slide, we started a series of reports called Falling Through the Net. The first Falling Through the Net report was exactly 25 years ago this July. And what we tried to do was take a look at what the disparity was with, between people who had access to the tech, uh, to computers and people who didn't have access to the computers or com to computers or internet. And we started that as a baseline in 1995, and we discovered what we thought we discovered. In 1995, only about 50 million people were on the internet across the globe. Most of them were high income. Most of them were affluent. Most of them lived in the suburbs or in affluent urban areas. We found that if you were black, if you were brown, if you were low income, if you were um, uh, rural, you were less likely to have access. And that first study gave us a baseline. In 1999, this third study, which is the slide you're seeing, demonstrated that the divide had grown, that we actually were seeing more disparity over four years. The Clinton administration is committed to connecting schools and hospitals and rural health clinics, but fewer people had access rather than more people. Next slide, please. Today, 25 years after the first report on the internet, uh, on the uh, digital divide, one out of 10 Americans are offline. And that sounds better than saying that 27 million American adults don't use the internet at all, that almost 90 million don't have home broadband, that 50 million of our fellow citizens are smartphone dependent for internet. Next slide, please. There are 150 million, 140 million people who don't have fixed home internet, 140 million people. If you think about what that means, in a city like New York, in the heart of the pandemic, there are more people in New York City that don't have home broadband than there are people in the city of Houston, Texas. And that's if we use the FCC's outdated definition of 25 meg down and three uh, megs up. Nobody would actually buy that service if they didn't have to. So the definition is a bad definition and still 140 million people don't have that level of basic broadband. Next slide, please. Pew Research Center is showing us that 80% of white US households have home broadband but only two thirds of black households and only 61% of Hispanic households. If you have an income of over 75,000, you have a 92% chance of having, uh, having broadband, but only 56% under 30,000 do. Next slide, please. So who's not online? One out of 10 American adults, but a quarter of our senior citizens, 65 or over, don't have broadband. If, you have, if your income is under 30,000, it's one in five likelihood you don't have broadband. Almost one in three Americans with a high school education don't have broadband. And rural Americans, 15% of rural Americans don't have home broadband. Next slide, please. Jeffrey Starks and his colleague, um, Jessica Rosenworcel, have been particularly focused on the homework gap because it's, it's a real problem when children don't have access. Seven out of 10 teachers use, um, require broadband connectivity to kids do their homework. And it, we know that at least 5 million low-income US households have children without internet. And that's the so-called homework gap. 27 million people filed for unemployment in the last month and a half. How many more children will be on the other side of the homework gap as their parents can't afford to connect to the internet? Next slide, please. When we all went home, everybody said, kids, go home to your school, go home, go home and work from home and do your assignments online. For a lot of kids, this is their home. There are not just kids in K through 12, but I'm on a couple of university boards. And there are a number of students, possibly numbering in the millions, 
who go to state universities or public universities or private universities who are home and don't have the access they need to continue doing their college coursework. I did a, a speech up at City University of New York about uh, six months ago, five months ago, and half the kids at City University of New York relied primarily on the university or other public access points to do their homework. 250,000 students, another 250,000 extension students, and many of those college students don't have home broadband access. Some of them were even doing their homework over their, um, on their um, iPhone or their Android because they didn't have a laptop. Next slide, please. So who's the most likely not to, uh, to be on the other side of the digital homework gap? Disproportionately black and brown students, but also any low-income student, 45% of, of low-income students do their homework on a cell phone. Next slide, please. One in four lower income students don't have access to a home computer. For Hispanics, it's 18%. That's an incredible number when you think of how important a child's education is. Next slide, please. And it's gotten to the point where school districts have actually suggested to parents that they sit in the school parking lot with their children in order to access Wi-Fi during this pandemic. If you don't have a car, you're just gonna sit out in the cold or in the rain. If you do have a car, you're gonna drive, you're gonna to have to do something to drive your car to this, to this spot. There are stories of parents who use their cell phone to download the, the, the lesson, take a photo with their iPhone of the lesson, print, have the child handwrite the lesson, and then the parent will take a photo and send it back to a school. We can do better than that. Next slide, please. But it's not just kids, it's also senior citizens. At a time when senior citizens are being told to keep distant because they are more vulnerable to these illnesses, one in four, more than one in four senior citizens don't have access to the internet. And when you talk about low income senior citizens, that number gets even higher. Next slide, please. We have a, an incredible opportunity to do something meaningful now. And the FCC has been doing a lot of work with regard to some of these programs. But there's been a disproportionate focus on rural broadband. The FCC announced a $20 billion uh, program for rural broadband deployment over the next decade. And no one should be um, averse to doing things for rural Americans. We need to connect rural Americans. But the reality is there are three to four times as many urban Americans today who don't have access because they can't afford it as there are rural Americans who don't have broadband because they can't access it. I've been to Cut and Shoot, Texas. I've been to Barrow, Alaska. I've been to the Central Valley in California. The students there, the parents there, the adults there, they need broadband. But so do the kids in inner city Houston or Detroit. In inner city Detroit, 60% of the kids don't have access to the basic tools they need for their education and their home. We have to do as much as we can for rural America, but we can't politicize the digital divide. And that's the thing that worries me most. Over the last few years, digital divide has become more and more synonymous with rural. It is not. Of the 20 to 25 million American households, that don't have access to broadband, 15 to 20 of those are urban households. Next slide, please. There are other tools we're using. The E-rate was established by the 1996 Telecom Act. It connects schools and libraries. It helps bring the cost down for those schools, particularly in low income and rural areas. It's incredibly important. There are approximately $4.15 billion funding. It's an important program. Next slide. And we're gonna ask the E-rate to do more. We're talking about having schools and libraries uh, be used um, as places people can come, as in Philadelphia, but also more and more schools and libraries are giving low-income people hotspots so they can go home and use the technologies. What's important to remember, though, is these hotspots are not the, um, the, the answer for many students. And some families have said to me that they can't use hotspots for Zoom. There just isn't enough bandwidth there. Next slide, please. Uh, Senator Markey and Congresswoman Meng have introduced a bill to put $2 billion more to help um, with the E-rate and other FCC programs during this pandemic. Next slide, please. And Lifeline was a program that was begun in 1985 when telephone penetration rates were low. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. In Bed-Stuy in 1980, telephone penetration was 60%. For white Americans across the country, it was 95%. Lifeline was originally begun to help bring people into the telephone network. After Katrina, we upgraded it so that it could be used for cell phones. And then after, um, uh, more recently during the, uh, when Gigi was working with Tom Wheeler at the FCC, they expended that, extended that to broadband. But let's be important, let's note about Lifeline. You only get one device. You only get $9.95 a month. And so if a mom takes Lifeline so she can have a cell phone, that means there's no home broadband. 
if a dad um, decides that his mom needs, um, that, that the grandma needs a home telephone connection so she can stay connected and doesn't want a cell phone, that means there's no cell phone or broadband connection. We've got to do more with Lifeline. Right now, it's about approximately a billion dollars annually for Lifeline. Next slide, please. I have some suggestions there. We need to have a meaningful level of broadband, 25-3 is an acronym. We need to increase funding dramatically. And I know uh, Congresswoman Doris Matsui has a bill to increase funding for Lifeline, but other members are also involved in that effort. We need to uh, allow people to have more than one device under Lifeline. We have to require, I think we should require the FCC to provide annual reports on the success of Lifeline. We know that Lifeline's had success with regard to increasing telephone penetration back in the 80s. Can we do more with the internet in the 19, in the 2020s? Next slide, please. Um, Tim Berners-Lee has a concept called meaningful connectivity. It's a global concept. I think we need a concept such as meaningful connectivity in the United States. We need to say, what does broadband connectivity mean? What does internet connectivity mean? How do we ensure that everybody's participating? Next slide, please. Here's the biggest problem. The oldest, the youngest, the sickest, the poorest, the hungriest, the most recent immigrants, those who are rurally, uh, rural or geographically distant, the most vulnerable among us, are the ones in our society most likely not to be connected to the internet. And they're also the people in our society most likely to be dis um, uh, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. These are the people who need the benefits the net can provide. And I'm glad that the panel here today is working so hard. It is important to remember, it's not just the FCC, it's not just those of us on this, on this panel. There are thousands of organizations and hundreds of thousands of people across this country who are working to bridge the digital divide. And we should all thank them. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. That was really, really powerful. Um, I want to just ask you a, a follow-up question. Um, you have uh, you pointed out in the presentation that rural connectivity is being prioritized um, over the uh, those in more urban areas who te who in technically have have access to connectivity, maybe can't afford it, maybe choose not to do it. You have some very what seemingly very sensible solutions. What are the obstacles as you uh, begin to socialize your recommendations? What obstacles uh, are you facing towards adoption right now when it's clearly such a crisis during the pandemic? Yeah, I was involved when Lifeline got established 35 years ago. And for 35 years ago, there's been opposition to helping poor people get connected to technology. We're willing as a society to invest in rural. We're not willing as a society to invest in low income. And I don't, and you know, Yesterday or two days ago, President Trump talked about a, a broadband infrastructure, which is important. And in talking about that bill, he talked about rural only. Um, in Congress, the Senate has opposed every meaningful lifeline effort for almost 20 years. Um, I don't understand completely why it is. We have to connect people. We know what we need to do, and yet we can't get funding. In the last two or three stimulus bills, there have been efforts to increase lifeline funding, and they've all fallen short. Let's hope we're able to do it now. But we politicize this term so that if it's not helping rural, there just isn't the um, will, particularly in the Senate, particularly among Senate Republicans, to support meaningful efforts to bring people online. Okay, let's bring on our other uh, panelists to, to, to dive into this a little bit uh, further. So uh, let's see, we've got everybody. Commissioner Starks, I see Gigi and Jim. Okay, welcome everybody, welcome. We're gonna... Um, dive into uh, a, a conversation. Reminder to everybody, we're gonna get to your questions soon. The, please use the Q&A button, not the chat function, but the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please uh, keep your uh, questions clear, succinct. Please add your name and your affiliation if you are comfortable doing so, we would really appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Starks, I wanna come to you uh, next. You have put forth a, a connectivity stimulus in a recent uh, New York Times op-ed, I'll, I'll post the link to that in the chat function in a second, um, specifically about the importance of affordable broadband during the crisis, and specifically about the Lifeline program, which um, Larry uh, spoke about, uh, which will provide you know, further connectivity to low-income families, um, as well as to those in rural areas, tribal communities. Um, talk to us a little bit about what your recommendations are and, and, and what the prospects are for it going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vivian. Thank you, of course, to Aspen for inviting me to be on such a, a distinguished panel here. Uh, you know, all our friends and all our people that, uh, that I want to hear from, truth be told. And I've said it before, 
my good, it, it's always hard to go after my good friend, Larry Irving, whenever he presents, because he's such a powerful advocate and, uh, and knowledgeable and deeply experienced as well. Um, so to, to come to the question, I, you know, I wrote a New York Times op-ed because um, rightfully so, we were hearing about how do we stimulate our economy? And I agree with that. How do we um, get more public health and stimulate some of the public health we need? And, and I agree with that. But what I wasn't hearing as a, a strong thread of the conversation is how do we form a connectivity stimulus? Because each of us um, that has broadband is seeing what it is doing for powering truly our economy right now. Uh, it is helping educate our young learners. I have uh, a preschooler here in my home, like millions of Americans that have a K through 12 student. And Larry's exactly right that, you know, now that a lot of our college students and university students are kind of in the diaspora where they're back at home, connectivity is important for our learners as well. Telemedicine as well. And so what I called for in the op-ed, uh, some of those have come to pass. Telemedicine was appropriated $200 million uh, in the CARES Act. And so that's something that the FCC is getting out that's helping keep um, our doctors and our, our, our patients more healthy. Uh, we also, one of the things that I called for was uh, making sure that where there's underutilized um, uh, spectrum, in particular in the 5.9 band, uh, that we deploy that because we can't just have, uh, we know the need is there and there's no reason to hold on to that spectrum when it can be better uh, utilized and deployed. But a lot of what I called for has not come to pass. And that is making sure that lifeline is expanded. We have millions more struggling Americans. And, you know, the number went from, um, uh, you know, six to 13 to 22 to 26 now. And, you know, the course of four or five weeks, we have nearly 26 million Americans that are recently um, uh, unemployed. And so lifeline is going to have to expand and it's going to have to help um, uh, meet the need of Americans right now, uh, calling for an expansion of E-rate. Uh, we do need more hotspots. We know that we're handing a lot of, um, a lot of schools are technically open to hand off free lunches for a lot of Title I households. Uh, and I do agree that we should be handing them a hotspot as well. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have only, it's hard to estimate, uh, I'm hearing from industry, uh, we have around 500,000 or so hotspots here in the United States that can be utilized and deployed. Uh, they actually come from South Korea and China, uh, and so it's going to be a while before there's more of a pipeline there. And so what we're really going to need is an affordable broadband for millions of homes and making sure that those that are disconnected um, get that connection because we can no longer afford, in times of emergency, we cannot have Americans remain disconnected because of cost. And what is the uh, what are you what's your prognosis on the on the uh, on the stimulus money that you're uh, requesting coming through? What are the obstacles? Yeah, I mean, I think the obstacles are um, you know um, you know I think there are kind of three main planks that I think uh, we have to have hit, uh, and that is making sure that we do right size lifeline. Um, again, we have so many struggling Americans, that issue has gotten politicized, um, but I think wrongly so. Uh, you, Lifeline is the only federal program specifically designed to connect low-income folks. And we know, as I mentioned, we have millions more Americans that just six weeks ago were secure but are now sliding uh, into um, uh, an insecure status. And one of the things that I've called for and a number of recent speeches uh, and, and a number of events is that we know that there are, as we sit here right now, about 7 million Americans that are on Lifeline. We know that, and these are old numbers, by the way, 38 million Americans are eligible. Uh, and so what does that mean? If you do the math, about 19 to 20% of Americans that are eligible are actually enrolled in Lifeline. Considering the number of struggling Americans, we have got to do better with that. And so I've called on the FCC to enter into a number of MOUs uh, with USDA, who is in control of SNAP, with HHS, who's in control of Medicaid, uh, with Veterans Affairs. We have got to make sure that Americans are better uh, aware uh, of Lifeline and are able to use this program. And, and lastly, to put kind of a cap on that, um, 
it's kind of like motor voter, uh, I think is what we need to get to because when you go to, I live in uh, the district of DC, when you go to DC and you get a, a new license, they ask you, would you like to be res registered to vote, sir? It's called motor voter. If you are a new enrollee in SNAP, SNAP is one of the qualifying uh, eligibilities for Lifeline, we should be following up with you to make sure that you know about Lifeline because there's the, that's the only way that we're gonna start to see around the corner and have a suite of services that um, uh, Americans that are struggling uh, are going to need to turn to. And they shouldn't have to go through the silo of every government agency to, in order to get the help. But really, I think broadband has got to be a part of, of the next wave of stimulus. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that uh, digital connectivity is powering our world in more ways than ever on every front, on the medical front, on the education front, on uh, powering our economy. And so it's got to happen where we have um, um, stimulus for broadband to make sure that all Americans get connected. Thank you. Well, sometimes it takes a crisis. Uh, maybe this is the crisis that will lead to this kind of long-term change. Uh, Gigi, um, Son, I want to uh, bring you on. You have been um, uh, a critic of the FCC, not necessarily Commissioner Starks, but the FCC saying uh, uh, around, uh, uh, when it comes to the program, saying uh, they need to introduce competition and more innovation. I'd like you to expand on that. I'm also curious, what you think we've learned about the digital divide that we didn't know before this pandemic began? Sure. So let, let me take uh, let me take your first question first. And um, Commissioner Starks is far too kind uh, in in not saying that the chairman of his agency has waged a three year war on Lifeline. Uh, and one of the reasons that eligibility, as as he mentioned, uh, twenty percent of eligible folks who are eligible for Lifeline actually take advantage of the program. And in fact, during the three years of Chairman Pai's term, uh, the program has gone down by 50% or 40%, excuse me, 40% of people who applied no longer apply and the budget has gone down by a half. So, and this is because of, of a concerted effort to make it difficult for Lifeline recipients to, to get the benefits that they deserve. The biggest thing in my mind, there have been a number of things, and we don't have time to tick through all of them, but you talked about competition. When I was at the FCC working for Chairman Wheeler, one of the things we did when we brought Lifeline into the broadband age was we streamlined the process for Lifeline providers to, uh, for companies to become Lifeline providers, to bring more competition into the program so that would lower prices and make services better. So we created something called the Lifeline Broadband Provider, and you didn't have to go state by state by state to get eligible. You could just come to the FCC for one-stop shopping. And towards the end of the, the Wheeler administration, we uh, permitted nine new broadband providers into the program, and when we were hoping that more would. This was something I cared deeply about when I worked on this. Well, almost a week after uh, Ajit Pai got named chairman, he reversed the decision to allow nine new broadband providers into the program, and he eventually did away with the national broadband provider uh, uh, designation. So now, if you want to get into the, broad, uh, the Lifeline program, you have to go state by state by state by state. The other thing that the chairman has done, and, and I think this has been really, really critical, uh, is he has made it more difficult for the full launch of something called the National Lifeline Eligibility Verifier. And what this would do was it would allow you to put your name into a database, okay, which every state would connect to with all the SNAP databases and all the Medicaid databases and all the government assistance databases that make you eligible for Lifeline. So you'd get, you'd get verified, validated almost immediately or very, very quickly. Well, he has basically impeded uh, the full launch of that verifier. So for example, in most states, they haven't uploaded their SNAP databases and 33% of Lifeline uh, recipients get SNAP as well. So it's those kind of activities that really have made the, the program unattractive. I just wanna say one last thing because the war is not over. You know, even during these times, the FCC is asking, uh, the majority is asking whether Lifeline companies should give free phones 
along with lifeline service. Imagine if we, as some at the FCC would like, would force poor people to put quote unquote skin in the game and have to now buy these devices. That would knock probably another several million people off the rolls. So this is my concern is that there's, there's been a war and Congress and the FCC need to stop that war. Thanks, thanks Gigi. I wanna actually, on the subject of devices, I, I wanna use this as an opportunity to bring Jim on. Um, are you with us? Yes, great. Um, so, uh, so Jim, uh, talk to us a little bit. Your focus of course is on the homework gap. Um, 12 million kids don't have access to the tech they need for distance learning. Uh, you are focusing um, uh, with common sense, your common sense organization, uh, both on broadband, but also about the availability of laptops and other technology that kids right. need uh, in order to be able to, to do school at home. So talk to us a little bit about what you're doing. So basically, um, I think there are three things that we need to solve the, the homework gap and actually to take advantage of this crisis. Um, and they involve connectivity, devices, and then content. And by the way, just as I, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues on the panel, I think what Larry said and what Jeff and Gigi said are exactly correct. All, the only thing that stopped this so far is just disgraceful politics, nothing else. This is just, we sit out here and watch this, and this is a disgrace. This is a simple issue to solve. It should be solved. There's, it's nothing more than partisan politics. Do not kid yourself. It, that's all that's going on here. Having said it, I think we can actually take this moment and, and solve the digital divide once and for all if we work together. But it may not actually just be the FCC. So if you're, take California, for example. So you have about a million and a half kids out here who need both devices and connectivity in their home. We're going to solve that, I think, in the next month in California without the FCC, with the complete inaction of, of what we were just hearing about. Because one, the device companies will step forward and provide them either for free or at reduced cost. For example, we worked with Austin Butner, the superintendent of LA Unified, to provide hotspots for 100,000 100, hotspots in Los Angeles, which should take care of most of the homes that need it in LA. And then the major device providers, which are really at, at the end of the day, Google and Apple, and it's mostly Google because most of the devices that you need are Chromebooks because they're much less expensive. Um, I think that the private sector will actually take care of that in California. So you need a big, despite the pathetic politics of the Washington, this can be done at the state level, even in the largest state in the country, by getting the industry to step forward and provide the devices either for free or greatly reduced cost. Same thing on connectivity. That's exactly what will happen. And having had conversations with the CEOs of all these companies in the last week, and now my brother's been appointed to run a commission on economic recovery. You mentioned who your brother is for those who don't my know. Brother, he's a guy named Tom Steyer. He's my younger brother. He ran for president. But he's mostly a successful businessman, just like Austin Butner, the head of LA Unified is. And I think we're just going to solve it state by state until the federal government gets its act together. And the truth is you need devices and the industry. The only issue on devices, by the way, is lack of devices in the supply chain. That's all we're really seeing is that there actually aren't enough devices right now. Most of them are being manufactured in Asian countries and there's such a high demand that the only issues we're aware of are supply chain issues in Asia. But I think that the private sector will step forward and do that. I think they will also provide the connectivity. This is for California. And, it's, and then on the content side, we launched wideopenschool.org, which is sort of a central hub for all the best content that schools need, that families need and all, and, and that all the kids, and I loved, Larry, that shot you had on the screen when you were doing your slide presentation of five people in one room. I just hope our audience realizes that that is a reality for millions of people in this country right now. But the bottom line is, I'm quite confident we're going to solve this. And I actually think that the FCC and the federal government will be shamed into this. Gigi and, and, and Jeff and Larry are correct. All that's happened in Washington is politics, nothing else. And it's the disgraceful partisan politics that's damaged our country so much in so many different ways over the past few years. And so I think this is going to get solved at the political level in Washington at some point. But in the meantime, I think we're going to solve it at the state level, state by state. Well, you, what you're describing is some success in, in, in California. And, yep. uh, you know, the, the Googles and Apples on the other uh, manufacturers have been, you know, are, are stepping in. Um, is that tenable across all 50 states? I think it is actually. And I think that, yes, because they're trillion dollar companies. And actually the amount of money here 
isn't that huge. I mean, it's a few billion dollars at the end of the day for all of this, right? And these, and, and it, by the way, obviously this should be coming through the Lifeline program and through E-Rate. This is a no brainer. Gigi knows that when back in the Wheeler, when Wheeler was uh, the chairman, we did the lead commission. I did it with Margaret Spellings and Lee Bollinger and Jim Coulter. We got all of this that we wired every classroom in America in a bipartisan effort. And by the way, Margaret, the former education secretary, under George W. Bush is gonna be involved in the effort I'm talking about right now. And we're gonna do Texas, by the way. She is a prominent Republican leader there. And even though you have a fairly spineless governor in that state on these issues, uh, this is gonna get done. I think it'll get done in other states. So, and, and by the way, the, the, the obvious bipartisan solution here is rural and urban together. You heard uh, Larry and Jeff talk about the urban rural thing, and, and it's correct. The, the truth is that's that is just code word for Republican and Democrat. So the Republicans care about uh, solving the digital divide for rural families because they think they're going to vote Republican, and and the urban poor, which are the most at risk of all this, are generally seen as Democratic voters. That's really how pathetic the politics of it are. So what I think will happen is you're going to see a bipartisan effort to do rural and urban together, and in the meantime, I do believe that the industry and individual states can probably get most of this done while we wait for the FCC and the federal government to get its act together. Well, I can't think of a more bipartisan um, cause than kids no in both rural areas and in urban areas having access right. to both the connectivity and the devices that they need. Um, I do want to turn um, to the, we're getting a lot of questions, uh, really great questions from the um, from the audience. So I'm going to jump in. And if you forgive me, I'm I have to filter through uh, them a little bit. So uh, forgive me if I'm, you see me looking to the side. Uh, this question comes from uh, Carol Matty, who's a former FCC sta staffer who uh, supervised the Lifeline program. Her question um, uh, is to Commissioner Starks. Uh, Commissioner Starks offered a concrete suggestion on what needs to happen to get low income households automatically enrolled in Lifeline to address the low enrollment aspect of the program. Any thoughts on what dollar level of subsidy above the current $9.25 a month would be necessary to make broadband truly affordable for low-income households? That's for you, uh, Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you. Uh, and, and I did notice that both Larry and Gigi uh, uh, wanted to jump in maybe in, in uh, in reaction to Jim. So if folks want to um, uh, certainly have kind of a circle uh, around Robin here, happy to do that. Uh, I don't have a particular number in mind. I do think that uh, in order to expand Lifeline, again, it's a 925 subsidy that goes to the providers. I do think we're going to have to up that number. If we do have an affordable broadband plan uh, that pays for uh, fixed broadband connectivity to homes, I think that's going to have to also be, you know, Folks are work trying to work this out on the hill, um, and and those are conversations that um, you know I'm a part of, and so I, I you know I don't want to get ahead of my skis there on that front. But I think it is going to be important for these millions of homes uh, to continue to uh, get the connectivity that they need, and it's going to have to expand. Lifeline is going to have to expand. It's going to have to expand beyond the thousand minutes and three gigs that it has, which is you know kind of an ancient relic of a, of a program. People, especially if they are disconnected, do not have a home connection, they're relying on their phones more than ever. And so to have you know these kind of caps uh, to Lifeline, I think is, is ridiculous. There's a 75 uh, number members of the Senate signed on to a letter that was publicized just this morning that was talking about how in the light of having so many small, um, uh, small and mid-sized uh, um, broad, uh, um, uh, broadcasters uh, and local papers that are truly um, struggling throughout this, uh, that they were encouraging them to rely more on government advertising. Uh, we know that the government has been advertising for, let's say, the U uh, we know for the U.S. Census. I think they should be advertising for Lifeline. Considering how underutilized the program is, uh, I think it's important that more Americans know about it. We know more Americans are sliding into a status where they uh, need, like I said, a wraparound service. Uh, you know, when somebody knocks on the door and says that they need help, they shouldn't have to ask and knock down each door. 
uh, we should make sure that we open the suite of doors. And so I think we should be uh, advertising with government dollars for the Lifeline program. Did somebody else want to jump in on that one? JG, go ahead. Yeah, so I actually have a number, uh, and that's uh, twenty dollars a month, and which should, which is a little bit more than double of what they have now. And also, I think that uh, that the FCC has to open up the Lifeline program to anybody who uh, has applied for unemployment benefits in the last six weeks. I'd also like to see Congress give money to the states so that they can complete the national eligibility verifier. But if I could pick up on something that Jim said, and nobody is a better advocate for getting all kids connected than Jim Steyer, I will say. And I will also say that there are some companies, Comcast in particular, who've done a really good job of trying to connect folks. However, uh, the Los Angeles Times had a story today uh, about how kids in Watts, okay, that's the middle of Los Angeles, can't get Comcast. They can't get cable service. So there are these pockets. There are people that live in apartment buildings who, you know, where there are, the landlords have an exclusive with a different provider that doesn't provide a low, a low cost broadband program. So this is why you've got to have a fully funded lifeline. This is why Chairman Pine needs to give some of the extra E-rate money he didn't spend last year so people can get connected. He says, well, I can't do that because the law says, well, the, the money has to go to connectivity to the classroom. But I can tell you, my daughter is right below me and her classroom is her bedroom. So he has the authority to free up that money and Congress should make more money available as well. Jim, before you jump in, I just wanna make three quick points. One, thanks to Carol, uh, thanks for Carol for that question. Carol worked on the first um, digital divide report. So she goes back along with these projects. The second thing is on the rural thing, I don't disagree that this should be an urban, rural, Democrat, Republican come together. But when Chairman Pai puts $20 billion into rural and zero into urban or lifeline or anything else, it takes away the bargaining ability for those folks who want to see urban people get connected. Because the rural guys know they got $20 billion. And so now you've got to start from zero to get anything. Meanwhile, rural's fat and happy. And, and no, one's actually, no one's fat and happy. We need to do both. And the fact that we can't come together as a country to take care of our rural and our urban is problematic. And, and the third thing with regard to Lifeline is we have to change several definitions. The $20 sounds great to me. We have to change the definition of 25-3, but we've got to make sure that every person, as Jeff and Gigi have said, that is recently traumatized by this um, pandemic is able to stay online. It is the one essential tool during this life during that. this time. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, from Juan Martinez. I don't know affiliation. Um, his question is about the role of philanthropy in answering these gaps and the severity of the digital divide in the age of COVID-19. Um, is there a role, a substantial role for philanthropy to try to close, uh, to bridge that divide? So I take that one. I yeah, take. I I'd be happy to take that. Here's what I'd say. I, I look, and by the way, to to the point that uh, Gigi just made about Comcast in LA, that's because the provider is Spectrum Charter, right? So we've also spoken to the CEO at Spectrum and Charter in recent days. I think they'll come through. But the bigger player there is Verizon. There's only a look. This is really simple. You really need AT and T, Verizon, and Sprint, T-Mobile, and then you need the three big cable players, which are you know Charter. Uh, Comcast and Cox. And we've been speaking to all three, the CEOs of all six of those companies, and they're going to at least step forward in California without government, without the government even having to intervene, because it's in their long-term self-interest, by the way. What's so obvious about everything we're saying is this is in the best interest of everybody, certainly when it comes to kids, but this is like a no-brainer for the country. So the idea that partisan politics would, would get in the way it's insane. That's why I'm optimistic it'll actually happen, by the way. And let's give everybody credit when it does, right? And all the people who've staunchly opposed it and messed it up, who, sh who, sh who have been shameless in their, in their treatment of this issue, should all get congratulated at the end, and we can all sing Kumbaya, and we should. And that's what will happen. I would predict here, live, that that is what will happen. But in the near term, the companies can actually take care of this. And I don't know if I'd call that philanthropy. Yes, philanthropy can help. So for example, there are a number of foundations like the Gates Foundation, the Walton Foundation, 
and others that actually get this issue because they care about education. So obviously when kids are doing distance learning at home, they have to have devices and connectivity or they can't go to this online school. Like my two kids are in another room in my house right now. That said, I don't look at that as philanthropy. I look at that as smart corporate social responsibility because in the long run, they're gonna have new customers and new employees. So I'm not, and that's a, it's excellent, Mr. Martinez call it a philanthropy, but I, I call it enlightened corporate behavior. And I think that we're gonna see that uh, that be the first step to get much of the country done state by I think it'll go state by state. And then hopefully the federal government is gonna get its act together and provide the funding. And there's no three better experts than the three other panelists on this about the details of Lifeline and E-Rate. You've assembled an amazing group of people here, Vivian. But I actually think we can get this done just because of smart corporate responsibility, period. It is heartening just to put it, just to put it, <laughs> be an optimist for a second to see uh, the ISPs, the uh, hardware manufacturers, uh, philanthropy coming together to fill the gap um, the the uh, the gap still remaining being this stimulus funds uh, for to provide the subsidies needed for these for these uh, 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 services. Uh, I want to jump to a different uh, question now. Um, here's a question from Nick Fuchs, IT manager for Snow Isle Libraries in Washington State. How can libraries best help in this situation? We've seen some of that in Larry's presentation. So, so I guess let me start maybe um, libraries are essential, but libraries are closed. I think right now, one of the things that libraries can do or be hotspots. Um, they have broadband connections. They can throw a stick up at the top. People in the community can use them. That's the near term, but longer term to what Gigi and Commissioner Starks and Jim have talked about, we still have a lot of people who don't have much digital literacy. I mean, just, you could look at what I was trying to do, getting online, getting my, my slides going. Digital literacy is still a problem in America. Um, and libraries have been the critical point um, focal point for digital literacy. One other thing I wanna to talk to, I wanna to mention to Jim, I don't know if he's talked to PBS, but I just rolled off the board of PBS and they should be a, a partner of what you're doing with regard to content because they've got such great content, but libraries can also be a huge content partner to make sure that parents and students are getting the kinds of quality content they need. What can so they Larry, do the Larry, just to your point, Larry, just to your point about PBS, they are a partner in wideopenschool.org. They have a treasure trove of content but so are Sesame Street, National Geographic, Khan Academy, Scholastic, and let me go down. And the Aspen Institute should be as well, Vivian, because we <laughs> okay, put the, go, check out wideopenschool.org. We put it all, remember, we're Switzerland. Common Sense Media is Switzerland to the world. We have 150 million users. We have 70,000 member schools in the United States where we teach digital literacy, Mr. Irving. So we actually agree with you about that. But, and you're right, you should not give kids or adults connectivity, which is largely going to be hotspots in the near term, or devices without requiring a, cl a basic class in digital literacy and citizenship. So I agree with that, that point. But I think libraries are a huge part of that. That's a great question. Libraries are a huge part of the solution. And I think, I actually do believe we're going to solve this. Even, despite the politics we're all referring to, I think it's going to get done. So, if, I could, if, I, if I could just, oh, go ahead, Gigi. Yeah. So just very, very briefly, there's an organization called the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. And they represent uh, local folks who are getting people online. They just launched a program called the Digital Navigators, which is using, they're using the phone uh, to call people to find out what their needs are, to inform them about what Comcast is doing. And this is part of the problem, Jim, is that a lot of folks, if you look at that Los Angeles Times piece from this yep, morning, and right. maybe you can send it around to people, like 41% of the people in this, in this LA community didn't even know about these Correct. programs. So these digital navigators are, are, are going, you know, phone call by phone call, talking to people, not only telling them this is available, but helping them get online because there is, even though it's not the majority of the problem, affordability is, there are people that don't actually know how to use the right. internet. So it's a really important program. And this is happening in local communities. And Congress has had in front of it something called the Digital Equity Act now for over a year that would give $300 million to these local digital inclusion folks. And this is something that they really need to pass like now because it's a small amount of money that would go a really long way to getting people online. So I agree with all that. You know, we need extra devices. We need digital literacy. And for a number of folks that are um, in particular seniors uh, who are susceptible to, to, to fraud, uh, to cyber issues. So digital literacy has to be 
um, a key element there, and then getting the connections, and whether that's through hotspots, uh, most mostly. The last thing that I mentioned really quickly is when we're thinking about that great good day, uh, when the economy is going to rebound, and when jobs come back online, I have found in my um, uh, travels uh, that libraries are are, are um, on the very front lines of helping people tr start to get job ready again, helping people come up with uh, resumes, helping them get the potential job trainings, getting them to sites where they can get some job training. Uh, and so I would, I would call on libraries as they're starting to see around the corner uh, to also start to think about what, um, what that kind of job training uh, and helping get our, uh, our workforce back out there is going to look like. Thank you. Know, you. Uh, go, to, go ahead. Larry. The, here at the Gates Foundation had a, a library project. The first thing they connect with libraries, they kind of have taken the library project, and I was a consultant to them, so 20 years ago, and they've kind of moved that library program back to an international program. We may want to talk to folks at Gates and other places. We're going to need to reinvigorate our libraries as we come out of this for exactly the reasons that, uh, that Jeff's talked about. They are a, the first line of defense in a lot of ways to some of the problems we see. And, and embedded in communities and know their Everywhere. community. Uh, now I'm going to call on to the next question. Um, Sean Davis, Tech Policy Fellow at the Wikimedia Foundation asks, are there any positive models that should be highlighted when it comes to improving connectivity in rural and urban and rural areas? Um, I want to add on to that uh, a, a, a corollary question, which is something that, that, that a couple of you touched on, which is even where the, uh, the uh, uh, low cost uh, uh, connectivity is available, there is an education gap as well yeah. towards helping people that for whom there is either free or near free available connectivity to understand why this is so important and why they need it and not to be to, and why they need it. So, so if I could take that, a lot of the best models are community built. And one in 19 states in this country have state laws that prohibit communities from deciding whether to build their own broadband networks. And that is a major problem when it comes to connecting everybody because unlike, I mean, Jim says, well, the, com the, the company should have an incentive to hook up everybody. But the fact of the matter is there are some exurban and rural areas where it, it doesn't make sense for them. Community run broadband networks, on the other hand, they, their, their incentive is to connect everybody. So they, their prices tend to be lower and they tend to go everywhere, including the places that the big commercial players won't go. So if you look at places like Chattanooga, Tennessee, or Wilson, North Carolina, or Longmont, Colorado, which just got out under a state restriction by having a ballot initiative, uh, and Utopia, which is a Utah statewide network, and it's open access, meaning that any ISP can come and connect. And most Utahns have, uh, have a choice of like 15 different ISPs they can connect to. Those, those community-owned networks tend to work very, very well and tend to be lower priced. Thank you. We are coming towards the end of our hour. It goes so um, uh, quickly. I think I'm going to uh, just do a round robin with each of you and ask you to um, just uh, look into your uh, your 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 uh, your magic crystal ball. Thank you. I knew there was a word for that. A crystal ball, based on the efforts that you're all engaged with, based on what you're seeing, um, is there what will come out of this uh, crisis? Uh, in terms of solutions towards the uh, digital divide. Uh, uh, Jim, I'm going to go with you first. I know you're the ultimate optimist, so I should probably go, I should probably yeah. go to you last, but let's go ahead and get us started. I'll, I'll, I will pay for, I will bet you all dinner. I will pay. I, I will have to come to Washington, D.C. and see you guys. <laughs> but I will tell you that we will solve this um, in, the next, uh, in the next six to 12 months, with or without with or without the federal government. But I think the federal government will come along because it's so ob it's such an obvious no-brainer. But I actually think one of the good things that's gonna come out of the COVID-19 epidemic is that we're gonna be forced to solve the digital divide for all the right reasons. And bless you, Larry Irving, for having done this for so long and being the, the pioneer in the field and Gigi and the, for the incredible work you do and Jeff for doing such leadership at the FCC. But I actually, I'm, I, I am saying this publicly, I will buy you all dinner if we do not solve this and get everybody wired. You're right about education though. We do have to educate the public at a very granular level about this. 
but families get this. I will tell you, every parent in America knows their kid is going to have to be online, whether they're in preschool, like yours are there, Jeff, or whether they're, you know, K through 12. And as I said, look at wideopenschool.org. And, and, you know, if you go to commonsense.org, you can find everything you ever needed about this topic. But I, I am happy to pay for that dinner, and I will-, will You're on, in the you're on. Here. <laughs> okay, La Larry. Um, I'm not quite as optimistic. It took Lifeline 10 years to get from, because we did it state by state, to get from the point where African-Americans, Latinos had the same telephone penetration as Americans, but we did get there. So I know we'll get there. I don't think it'll be six to 12 months. I am also optimistic. But I, I think one of the things that will come out of this is a new appreciation for our senior citizens. I, I care deeply about children, but I'm also, I've got a mom who's 90 years old, who's in assisted living. And I have senior citizens on my block and I worry about the fact that we can't be with them because they are so sensitive. When we have one out of four senior citizens aren't connected at a time when they desperately need those human connections because they can't have the physical connections, we've got to do better by them. So my optimism is we're gonna figure out that the most vulnerable people right now, right now are seniors and we as a society have got to do better by them and we cannot have one out of four of them not connected. Right, Gigi? So it's unfortunate that it's taken a, a pandemic for people to realize that tens of millions of Americans are not connected. And also that connection to the internet is critical for full participation in society, our economy, our culture, talking to your neighbors now. But I think that's gonna lead to long-term change. You know, People are accusing me of, of using this pandemic to make long-term change. And my answer is, hell yes, I am. Uh, so I am optimistic. I do think this will lead to long-term change in, in the Lifeline program and the E-rate program. And I do think it will lead to a major broadband infrastructure bill. That's by and by, but not too far in the future. So I am an optimist as well. Great. Commissioner Starks, take us home. <laughs> well, I am an optimist as well, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, how much my, my heart breaks uh, in so many ways around this COVID-19 um, and each of us, you know, individually with families has our own challenges. Um, and, you know, but I, I would be remiss if, if I didn't uh, mention the racial aspect of this uh, mm -hmm. that I've seen. Uh, in particular, you know, this COVID-19 has exacerbated so many um, inequities wherever they are, whether that's on public health, we're seeing uh, disproportionately high deaths for African Americans, for communities of color. Um, and that, of course, ripples through uh, through to the digital divide, and and so many issues of uh, you know that we've been talking about, you know, poverty, folks that are living in close quarters, um, you know, so many of these issues are equities that are long lasting and persistent. I always in speeches talk about how, um, you, you know, Larry coined the term 25 years ago, but we are st still talking about a, a a monstrous digital divide that has morphed into a COVID-19 divide. Uh, and, and so much of this um, has laid bare so many inequities. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, it, it, and, and I really do think that um, focusing on densely populated urban areas that are getting hit the hardest here is going to be a focus of mine uh, and continue to be something that I'm going to continue to call for. Uh, thank you to the panel um, and and uh, putting us all together. And thanks, of course, for the great comments from everybody too. Thank, thank you for thank you for that for that comment. Of course, it is impossible to talk about the digital divide without talking about income inequality and race. Without a doubt, um, I want to thank everybody for being with us. I'm sorry we didn't get anywhere close to uh, a, a surfacing all of the great questions that came in, um, but hopefully we can do this again sometime. We will be posting video of this session later. You can find it on Twitter at, Asp, at Aspen Digital. Thank you so much to the panelists and thanks for everybody for uh, joining us. Uh, we will see you in the next a week or two to talk about the crisis in, uh, during COVID-19 in uh, local news. Thanks everybody much, bye-bye.